This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. So we'll be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. We want all voting to stop. It's not my place or Donald Trump's place to declare who's won this election. That's the decision of the American people. Late on election night, Donald Trump falsely claiming widespread voting fraud and falsely claiming he'd won the race. Joe Biden sounding confident but cautious that same night and making it clear that voters choose the president, not Donald Trump. I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times and welcome to a video conference edition of the New York Times Close Up. It seems fairly likely, but far from certain, as we're taping on Thursday, that Joe Biden will be our next president, but there'll be plenty of GOP lawsuits and recounts in the weeks ahead. And as the great philosopher Yogi Berra said, it ain't over till it's over. Stay with nytimes.com for up-to-the-minute developments while we take a big picture look at this campaign. What are the major takeaways from this wild and tumultuous election? Is Trumpism alive and well? How did the Dems spend so much money and fall flat in so many Senate, House, and State House races? And what should we make of yet another epic failure by the pollsters? Lots to talk about. We're joined by Peter Baker, the New York Times chief White House correspondent and author with Susan Glasser of The Man Who Ran Washington. Mark Leibovich, chief national correspondent for The Times Magazine, and Astrid Herndon, a Times national political correspondent who joins us from Wisconsin. Let me start with a question. It's a long one, so you've got time to think about the answer. This time, unlike in 2016, there was no major third party alternative. Biden was not Hillary Clinton, who began with a lot of baggage and arguably ran an ineffective campaign. Trump was no longer a refreshing face, the lesser of two evils, an outsider who people were willing to take a chance on. Instead, this time he was an incumbent. He'd been there almost four years. He was saddled with unemployment, a rising death toll from COVID. So why were the results almost exactly the same as they were four years ago, as best we can tell at this point? Peter, what do you think? Well, I think one of the things we've learned in the last four years uh, is that this is a country that is very, very deeply divided, closely divided, and that people are sticking to their sides of the argument. Basically, over the course of four years, we saw that President Trump's approval rating stayed almost precisely within a very narrow band the entire time. It didn't go radically up. It didn't go radically down like any president we've seen in the history of polling. In fact, he never one day for, of his presidency, not a single day, had a support of a majority of us, and yet he continued to, to, to keep the supporters he had when he got there four years ago. It never went down as far as, say, George W. Bush or, or Jimmy Carter saw when their presidency had rocky moments. And I think that just tells us that we're in this tribal moment in American politics right now. People have chosen sides. They are in their own camp. And they are making, uh, you know, decisions based from the, you know, from the start on who they are with, regardless of any intervening issues or developments that might otherwise have changed public opinion in the past. And I think you see that today that President Trump, whether he wins or loses, got around 48 percent at the moment, it looks like, in the popular vote. That's nearly half the country. And that means that's a durable coalition that isn't going away whether he's in the White House or not. Mark, one thing that surprised me is when you look at uh, his approval rating over the four years, it hovered somewhere around 40 percent in the low 40s. And people argued that he did not reach out to increase that base at all. And yet he increased it enough to get close to that 50 percent and perhaps uh, over the electoral votes he needed like he did four years ago. How do we account for that increase then? Well, I, I think, first of all, they made a very, very strong strategic focus on people who did not vote. I mean, it's non-educated 
mainly white voters who did not vote in 2016 in places like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and they seem to turn out more of them than they did four years ago. The other thing is a, a lot of people snickered at th that Donald Trump's alleged outreach to African Americans and Hispanics, but his numbers grew there and it, it actually turns out that it was a, a pretty robust growth area for him and it should have gone a lot higher if he maybe didn't have so many self-inflicted wounds. I think really the question here though is, yes, Trumpism is here to stay, but how durable is it without Donald Trump if Donald Trump is on the ballot? Because 2016 certainly was a, a earthquake of an election, but Republicans, when Donald Trump is not on the ballot, have underperformed pretty consistently. They overperformed, it looks like again this week as far as their turnout model, but it's unclear to me whether the waves of Trump supporters and Republicans or new Republicans would come out in say 2024 if it were Mike Pence's face on all of these billboards that you see all over the country, uh, whether he would get 10,000 people out to a rally on a cold day. So I think that's sort of the, the, the big question going forward for Republicans. Of course, the, the truism in uh, covering elections, of course, is who votes. So we can look at polls. All we want is people preferences. But the question is turnout, who actually shows up? Why would you think if you're in Wisconsin and have seen it on the ground, why would Trump voters have been more enthusiastic than Biden voters? Uh, presumably, he wanted to get rid of Trump. Is, is hate less of an emotion, uh, a forceful emotion than, than love in this case? Well, I think uh, uh, you have uh, a president who is good at getting out the ba his base, who has made that his focus and has found new voters on that front. And I think that uh, he is, he's kind of played the hits uh, for that community and, like, and, and we have seen some growth areas there, but I think we shouldn't overdo it. He lost Wisconsin, he lost Michigan. I mean, he's, he's on track to lose the presidency. And part of that is an erosion from the communities in which he had, and some of that is an increase from democratic support from four years ago. I think we have two things that can be true at the same time in this race, that Donald Trump is uniquely good at turning out a white conservative base and particularly inducing rural turnout in communities, and that there were some supporters that were not captured by polling. At the same time, I think we cannot overstate this still. It looks like a rejection of Donald Trump's uh, administration and one that, uh, is, 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 that is creating a coalition that is different looking for Democrats uh, uh, than we saw uh, four years ago or even eight years ago uh, under Barack Obama. Given the uh, role that Barack Obama played in this campaign, which was enormous and effective and powerful. How did that affect the uh, vote among Blacks, particularly among Black men uh, in Trump versus Biden? Um, I think we don't have full answers yet because exit polls can be particularly unreliable, uh, specifically this year when we have so much mail-in voting. Uh, what we do know is that in, in kind of uh, black population centers, uh, you did see some increased turnout relative to four years ago. Uh, so places like Philadelphia and Milwaukee and the like. Uh, well, so, and this is what Democrats were banking on. Even if Donald Trump made uh, kind of marginal inroads with black communities, uh, as it seems like he might have, particularly among black men, if that turnout grew uh, relative to four years ago, then that was still a good sign for Joe Biden. You want a, a, a larger, even if you have a somewhat smaller percentage, if the number, if the raw vote number is a lot larger, that was still going to help him. And I think that's about what we have seen. But I mean, I, I don't think... Um, you know, as the Trump was making his kind of investment in, in black communities specifically, we knew that that wasn't going to swing the election on its own, coupled if other things did not happen. Uh, he got some of that to happen, but, uh, you know, maybe I'm the, I, I, I'm the oddball here. But I think we can't overread into, into this. Uh, Donald Trump has a durable coalition, somewhat grew that among non-white voters, but it is not, it is a, it is not a winning one. Uh, point is what is what all the evidence says. Peter, uh, the count is still going on, of course, as we talk. It will probably go on for a long time. Uh, counts always uh, occur after the election. There are always recounts. There are always official counts before the vote is certified, uh, before the uh, Electoral College meets in December. What is different this time, if anything? On what basis can the count be legally challenged? Well, what's different on the basis this time is that you have a president of the United States who's trying to pre pre uh, present normal vote counting as somehow a fraud, somehow a crime, somehow a stolen election. You've never had in the history of the country that I can think of anyway, a president of the United States uh, going so far to try to undercut the 
credibility of an election that he himself uh, is in theory presiding over. And he's, he has presented zero evidence of any widespread fraud that would change massive numbers of votes. He just simply throws it out there like spaghetti against the wall, hoping to convince people that something is being stolen in order to either A, provide a justification for some of these legal challenges that most lawyers seem to think they're pretty groundless, or B, to justify a loss if at the end of the day he has to walk out of the uh, White House on January 20th. And if he, if he can say to people, I didn't lose, I wasn't repudiated by the voters, I, I had the thing stolen by nefarious deep state actors, the media and the Democrats, that will at least give sucker to his you know, wounded pride and maybe some of his supporters will buy it. But there's nothing, to, there's nothing unusual happening here except for the fact they had this massive flood of mail and vote we've never had before because of the pandemic. And so yes, in some instances, obviously it's gonna take a little longer. And in some instances we saw shifts in who had a lead at various points, depending on how these different pools of votes are being counted. There's nothing untoward about that. It just happens to be if you count election day ballots first, those happen to be more Trump voters. And then you happen to count mail-in uh, ballots later, those happen to be Biden voters. It doesn't mean somebody is actually doing something nefarious. It just means that you're counting different pools at different times. And as you count them, the numbers, uh, the total numbers are gonna change. But of course you have a president here who's not committed to upholding the validity of the election if it doesn't go his way. Mark, you mentioned something earlier that uh, I find significant. Uh, where are the Republican officials, the typical Republican election lawyers, uh, are they supporting Trump in this? It would appear early on that they are not. I mean, there we, we had in our in our paper today or yesterday, Maggie Haberman and Andy Carney wrote that, that Donald Trump and Jared Kushner have been sort of casting around for their Jim Baker. Uh, Peter Baker can talk about this better than I can, but Jim Baker is sort of the great elder statesman of the Republican Party. He led the recount challenge in, 20, in 2000 when George W. Bush and Al Gore were involved in that historic recount. And, you know, Jim Baker was like the go-to statesperson in, in, in these situations, and he was the obvious choice. Now, with, with Trump, you know, it doesn't seem like the Jim Baker exists anymore as far as, you know, in Trump world. It's just Rudy Giuliani and sort of sending him and Pam Bondi, former Attorney General of Florida, who's a big uh, Trump supporter, out and sort of seeing where it goes. But there is a whole team of elite Republican lawyers, beginning with Ben Ginsburg, who led the Bush challenge in 2000, who has been very vocal in the last few weeks in op-eds and so forth about how irresponsible he thinks that the current administration has been. Uh, it doesn't seem like they have a real army of lawyers at the ready just now. I mean, they might materialize. Uh, it's unclear, though, who these people are and what they think, you know, whether they want to be associated with a case with at least at this point doesn't seem to have a lot of basis in, in reality and, and really much of a chance of really getting anywhere. And Peter, you and your wife uh, wrote the book on Jim Baker. Where is he or where would he be uh, in this case? Has he said anything or where do you, what do you think he would say? He hasn't said anything yet, uh, but I think that this, the comparison of course is, is faulty. I mean, what happened in Florida is not what's happening now. Jim Baker, who was then managing George W. Bush's efforts during the recount in Florida, didn't try to cut off the voting before it had even been completed. Uh, what he did say was after it was completed that they didn't need to keep recounting and recounting and recounting the way the Democrats wanted to do. And even then, the, uh, the, you know, the, the issue was not throwing out whole categories of votes, uh, say 100,000 votes, because they happen to be cast through drive-in process as was done in Texas uh, this year. What they were trying to say is, you know, what do we do with these flawed ballots, some of which didn't have the holes punched all the way through or those kind of things. They had this granula, you know, granular, sorry, uh, fight about it. But that wasn't, what, Jim Baker wasn't in the same position. He also did not make these sort of baseless, uh, you know, remarkable claims of fraud and stolen elections. I mean, he and, and Al Gore and George W. Bush and all the players in that fought tooth and nail, knife fight all the way up to the Supreme Court People obviously who lost were disappointed with it, but they fought within the system and they respected the system. And when it was over, Al Gore gave a very gracious concession speech and said, you know, he believed in the system. And George W. Bush gave a very gracious victory speech and said, I'm now the president of all Americans, not just Republicans. And what you don't see that, uh, you don't see that kind of a message coming from this White House. Orsted, uh, you, as we say, have been on the ground in Wisconsin. You've been covering the campaign all along. The polls certainly seem to have underestimated uh, the Trump vote and the Trump turnout uh, all along. Uh, 
Why is that? Uh, is it that uh, people wouldn't admit they were voting for Trump because it didn't seem fashionable, that they thought the uh, people who were asking the questions, the pollsters, the media, uh, were just uh, you know people they didn't want to respond to? Was there some hidden backlash to, to Black Lives Matter, to racial unrest, perhaps to Kamala Harris uh, as well, uh, that wasn't being registered uh, also? What do you think? I mean, I think that those are just assumptions we can't make at this point. Uh, we don't have uh, clarity on that. And, and uh, certainly the same polling that was telling us that that wasn't registering is not the same polling we can rely on to say uh, uh, what did it, you know, and talking to folks on the ground. I mean, I think that sometimes we overthink uh, that maybe this is a rejection of Democrats and not just a unique connection to Donald Trump. Uh, uh, Donald Trump is someone who energizes a particular part of the Republican base, specifically through uh, a lot of identity politics, through white, uh, through, through a kind of an expression of white grievance, through a kind of uh, uh, framing Democrats as an existential threat to to the kind of the multi uh, to, to to America's fabric, and that um, the, the multiracial democracy is like a kind of threat to democ uh, to, to threat to Americanism, and I I think that that itself is a motivating factor for people, and so it's not necessarily sometimes what Democrats did not not do, but that Donald Trump speaks the language of the folks who support him. And so I think that uh, uh, that is somewhat is the driver of that. But we don't have a kind of clarity on what polling missed uh, at this point, rather than to say that it was a big polling error. But part of the reason that, you know, the, the data folks we were reading and writing was that they were clear this year that Biden's coalition is probably one that could survive a big polling error. And that's basically where we are right now. Whereas that those things were true. And there are certainly things that we need to understand about the country and about polling itself uh, uh, to, to, to kind of correct that. Uh, but the kind of framing of, of where Wisconsin is has, again, swung back to Democrats, uh, even with that reality. Mark, what was it uh, about money that made it not as important as it seems uh, this year than in other years? Uh, Biden had a lot of it, a lot of the Senate races, uh, Democrats outspent Republicans. Why did it not seem to have the impact that it ordinarily does? You know, we, we've seen a lot of examples in the last few years that money might be a little bit overrated as far as a campaign thing. I mean, I think one reason the I media- I always thought money was overrated. Too. Well, I mean, look, in 2016, I mean, Donald Trump and the RNC spent a, to a tiny fraction of what the Democrats and Hillary Clinton raised and spent. And I, I think in this case, Look, I mean, there's only so many levers a citizen can wield when they are trying to make change. One is voting, um, you know, another is volunteering, but like writing checks is how people sort of feel like they're contributing and being active. And, and obviously money is important to some degree, but I also think what we're seeing is even more importantly is, is how you spend the money and how you use the money. I mean, it's television advertising just sort of devolving into like this singular cacophony of of message that people just tune out after a while are the more effective ways to do this through social media, through, you know, old fashioned putting up signs. I mean, you know, I, I took, uh, I was driving around from basically Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina up, up to DC over the last week or so. And what's amazing is how much focus Republicans put on signage. Like Lindsey Graham and even like David Perdue and Kelly Loeffler, like the three Republican Senate candidates in Georgia and, um, in South Carolina. I mean, they just flooded the zone. It's very old school. And in a weird way, it's pretty effective. Um, maybe it is. I don't know. I mean, there's no way to quantify this. But again, I, I think Donald Trump in 2016, one of the many revolutionary things about his campaign is that he proved that you can win without spending a whole lot of money. And I, I think that maybe whether it's a positive thing or not, I think people need to evaluate, you know, the importance of fundraising, but also how money is spent and how you strategize once you have money. Speaking of strategy, Peter, uh, Biden ran a relatively limited campaign, his basement campaign early on, largely because of COVID. It was sort of a defensive campaign. Don't make any mistakes. In retrospect, was that the right way for him to run? Well, I think it will depend on the outcome. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a little early to say. I mean, in the end, it depends on how these, some of these states fall. They're so close that you could see anything from, you know, a bare majority electoral college victory to a rather significant one. I mean, it, 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 and, and we will judge his campaign based on that kind of result. Now, it's not the wave that Democrats wanted. What de Democrats wanted was to have 
such an overwhelming uh, you know, majority on election night that there wasn't going to be any question. There wouldn't be any room for legal challenge and that there wouldn't be any debate about whether or not Donald Trump had been repudiated or not. They wanted a landslide. They certainly wanted the Senate, which at the moment anyway, does not appear uh, at least easily in their grasp. And so this is certainly not uh, the result the Democrats wanted. But if, he, if, if Biden still comes out on ahead, you know, it, it's a binary thing. You're either in the White House or you're not. And Biden will be president no matter whether he gets 270 electoral college votes or 306 electoral college votes. So I think that, you know, judging what worked with this campaign and what didn't work with this campaign will probably depend on, on that outcome. And I think that, you know, again, there's larger phenomena at work here and, and people will make judgments about you should have done this, you should have done that. Uh, this was a static race. It didn't change. The numbers were very immune to actual events. The you know Biden had roughly the same advantage in the poll in July of 2019 that he had in October of 2020. Uh, now again, we can fault those polls as Asad talked about, but that didn't change. So for all of the we should have done this and should have done that, you know, it's kind of hard to pinpoint what would have actually made that difference. As did the coverage on the ground that uh, you and so many others from the Times were involved in, obviously it was affected this year by COVID. But looking back uh, at the results and what we wrote in the past uh, year or more, if you had to cover the campaign differently, knowing what you know now, would you have done anything different? I think that there are areas which we could have highlighted that were certainly uh, uh, reported on by some, but I think about my own coverage, right? I think about uh, uh, the work that folks like Jenny Medina and Patty Mazzetti did about uh, uh, about uh, Biden and, and Trump's durability with Latino voters, particularly in the South that we saw uh, uh, in Texas and in Florida. I think that work was done. I mean, I think that, I think uh, as, a, you know, as a scope of, of me personally, I think that, yeah, I look back and could have wrote maybe another one of those stories. I think that uh, uh, accounting for polling uh, errors is something that we try to bake into our reporting and framing that could have done more. But I think largely uh, what we are seeing is something uh, that, that, again, given the results that could change uh, in the coming days, is something that we, we, we seem, to, seem to highlight. I mean, uh, I mean, it's been a lot of last year writing about why grievance and identity politics and why Trump was uniquely good at, at, at energizing small rural communities. I mean, that's been very, very mm -hmm. true. Um, I think that sometimes the, 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 the polling reliability told us something like Wisconsin was a plus 11 or um, the Washington Post had him up plus 17. And certainly that informed some of the feelings here on the last day. But I don't think that completely negates what we were seeing on the ground, more so than couples. It. I think polling industry and, and reporting that relies on it has to, has to think of how do they find these people and how do they kind of make up the baseline. But I, I largely think our coverage hell holds up. Mark, uh, you reported on suburban women and why they seem to be listening to Ivanka Trump and why her message was resonating. Why did it? I'm not sure it actually did resonate. I mean, I don't, not, not to dispute the premise of the story. I mean, look, Ivanka Trump was sort of the, the Trump campaign and even the White House to some degree outsourced a lot of like outreach to to Republican women, to suburban women, like the sort of great migration of voters into the Democratic camp that we were hearing so much about. Um, you know, she made an effort. I mean, she is she's a unique figure within that orbit. Um, not sure what her political prospects are going forward, but but it does look like, at least from early numbers, that that women actually uh, voted more for Donald Trump than people expected. I mean, I think. What people might miss about this, and there's a lot of focus on Democratic hand wringing because it looks like Democrats aren't going to take the Senate. It looks like you know they lost seats in the House, and we don't know at this taping what what's going to happen in the presidential. But I mean, this was in fact a very winnable election for Donald Trump. Um, I mean, everyone said that once COVID happened, he was screwed. I, I think that that's a purely a flat out false assessment given that any number of governors across the country actually dis, you know, being dealt the same hand with a really, really tough pandemic to run uh, saw their popularity just really soar, both Democrats and Republicans alike. The other thing is, 
Trump, you know, does some uniquely self-destructive things that at the margins and in a very close election is going to go a long way. I mean, if you look at two of the tightest states out there, Arizona and Michigan, Arizona, I mean, did, did he really have to like trash John McCain for uh, four years? I mean, in a way that absolutely could have moved votes in suburban Phoenix and Scottsdale around there, um, you know, among Republicans, you know, John McCain is a beloved figure in Arizona. Same thing in Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, a very, very popular governor um, with, with bipartisan support especially in the suburbs of Detroit, um, who, you know, I assume had a great deal of suburban women's support. And he sort of went out of his way to trash her when she herself was trying to deal with the pandemic. Um, you know, some pretty ugly stuff happened there. And that itself, I, I think, could have been very decisive in a place like Michigan. So, I mean, yes, Ivanka could sort of help at the margins, but Donald Trump also could hurt himself at the margins, which I think is something that we shouldn't take, we shouldn't overlook when we look back on this. And Peter, very quickly, uh, we saw, uh, you predicted that Trump will remain a disruptive force, win or lose. Will we see any institutional changes as a result of this election quickly? I think after, if Biden ends up winning, I think you'll see a, a real desire on the part of Democrats to think about uh, changes that would uh, prevent some of the things that President Trump did over the last four years in terms of, uh, uh, you know, possible abuse of pardon power, possible, you know, the uh, targeting of inspectors general, things like that. But if he has, if Biden has a Republican Senate, uh, there's a limit to how much he's going to be able to do. So I think that that reform movement may be talked about. I don't know how far it will go. Thank you for joining us, Peter Baker, Mark Leibovich, and Ested Herndon of the New York Times. And for the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.